Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Perspective Philosophy. If you're new here, my name is Lewis and I'm a PhD student studying philosophy. In today's episode, we are going to be discussing the problem of free will and determinism. This video is actually going to be in response to cosmic skeptic Alex's video on determinism and compatibilism. So if you haven't seen them, I do recommend checking them out. I'll be framing my argument around Alex's argument for two primary reasons. One, because I think his argument is probably the most common I see today. And the second reason is because it's very similar to the approach that I used to take when I was an undergraduate. So first we will be discussing why determinism is untrue. Then we will move on to the problem of indeterminism and how that cannot be compatible with free will. After that, we will be discussing possible reconciliations of the individual with the indeterminacy from which they arise. And then we will talk about the overall conclusion of this video, which is that we are free and that freedom is not how it is framed in Alex's video. And that the problem with Alex's video and many other deterministic arguments is essentially the conceptual framing of free will. So without further ado, let's get into it. So what is determinism? Determinism is the theory that all human thought and action result from a prior cause. Think of it like this. The reason I am eating this cheese and onion roll from Aldi, vegan cheese and onion roll, is not because I have chosen to do so. It's because I desire to do so. That desire actually comes from me being a biological organism and my urge to eat food. So this cheese roll and my desire for it happened to me, not because of me. It didn't arise out of me and my being. It arose from nature itself. It arose from the universe. It arose from prior causes. Now, that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it could be that it arose because God determined it to be so. It was fated by the gods who have determined that I will desire this cheese roll. These are many theories of determinism, both secular and religious, but they all rely upon the same thing a governance of human behaviour from a law-like structure. What I will argue is that there can never be a law-like structure, that there can never be a cause and effect relationship which can determine the next step within a mind or society. This runs parallel to forms of sociology and psychology which argues that human behaviour is scientifically analysable that it can be known and predicted, like the movements of planetary bodies in the solar system. A law-like structure of human behaviour would be able to predict human action within the future, whether it's individualistic, of how I will behave tomorrow, or whether it's sociological, how we will behave in the next 10 years, the way that society will progress, and so on. So, running with the scientific paradigm that is most common today, science relies upon a deductive methodology called the scientific method. So what the scientific method is, is a form of philosophy. It's actually a deductive methodology used to test an individual's hypothesis for truth value, whether the proposition actually obtains truth value. So what we can see is that science is a body of knowledge. Science is not the way the world is. Science is how we think the world is. Science relies upon human engagement within reality to come to knowledge claims about reality. Let's think about it. When a scientist comes across limestone, what do they think of it? What do they understand it to be? They understand it to be a rock, mineral, consisting primarily of calcium carbonate, which is itself consisting of calcium, carbon and oxygen. Those calcium, carbon and oxygen particles can then be broken down further into more fundamental particles. And eventually we will reach the point in which we will hit energy, where all of these fundamental particles are actually expressions of energy. And since energy cannot be created or destroyed, all of this energy is the result of energy transferals that have occurred all the way back to the Big Bang. So any limestone that you come across is the result of the Big Bang, just as any other material substance that you come across is again the result of prior causes leading back to the first cause, or an infinite regression of causes. A story that really began 14 billion years ago, with a tiny universe where everything was all in one place. Then the Big Bang. All the energy that has ever existed, created in an instant. So if science is the analysis of objects, and in particular material objects, what is an object? 
How do we understand it to be material? Is that just given to us by nature? Do we look at a rock and instantly know that it's limestone? No. Instead, what we do is conceptualize. And in fact, this conceptualization process is actually the foundation of this entire universe, material or not. This means that the material universe is fundamentally dependent upon human idea. Let me explain. When you look up at the sky at night, what do you see? Do you see something that is pure sense data? The splashes of colour from the clouds, the light from the stars and the moon? Or do you see the moon, the stars, the clouds? What a cloud, a moon or a star is, is not something given to us by our perception, but is something constructed within our minds and then applied to reality. There is no such thing as a star, a moon or a cloud in reality. If we take reality to be that raw sense data, that pure experiential existence, what reality is in that case is undefined and undefinable. Reality is instead for us when we engage in science, a conceptual endeavour. Reality is just as much idea as it is physical and material, which is actually why a lot of our theories are incorrect at first, because if we were just abstracting truth from observation, then we wouldn't have any problems <laughs> with being correct. It would just be given to us and handed to us by nature. But instead, we have to think, construct new ideas, apply them, test them, and then see whether our defined parameters of these conceptual guidelines are actually fitting to reality. So reality at its best can never be reduced to a purely material cause. It has to be instead part conceptual, part idea. Kant was the first to show that the perceiver to make the world intelligible had to conceptualize it, that the world could not be itself given to the agent, but instead must be constructed by the agent. The agent has to take an active process in understanding the world and creating the world as much as the world provides that information to the agent. The individual cannot just understand the world implicitly. This is why the individual lives in the world of the phenomena and not the real. The phenomena is this perception that we all have. It is this understanding of reality in which we construct it is why I see in front of me a camera. It is why you see in front of you a screen. It is the difference between seeing the raw splashes of colour, the data, and the understanding of that thing. Because right now, you know that when you look at that screen, that it is comprised of electric circuits, lights, that it is being powered by the mains power supply that is plugged into. None of that is available to you in your pure perception. It's available to you after the fact of conceptualization. It is available within conception. And so when we look at science and its analysis, what we will find at the bottom of each and every single analysis, when we see something other than pure sense data, is a concept, is an idea, is an abstraction of mind applied to that object. And so at the bottom of all normativity, of science itself, of this objective investigation, we will see consciousness. We will see thought. We will not see a world that is external. We will see that a world that is actually internal in many ways. Mind cannot be overcome. It's not something that we should be trying to overcome. We don't try to remove all aspects of conceptualization from reality, because if we did, then what we would be left with is nothing. So this doesn't mean that I reject science. I actually love science. I, I wanted to be a physicist uh, before a philosopher. I find it highly interesting and incredibly insightful. And there's nothing in this that prevents anything like physics from functioning properly. If anything, it's just understanding what physics is and the foundations from which physics relies and the normativity at the bottom of everything. And since this normativity cannot be divorced from our experiences of reality, when we try to conceptualize of a cause prior to mind, what we are going to be conceptualizing as prior to mind is going to contain mind. The object that is 
prior that causes mind actually is fundamentally a construction of mind. So how could it be prior? How could it have caused mind to exist when its existence has been caused by mind? This is why Sartre, in response to psychology, in particular Freudian psychology, says this. It is futile to invoke pretended laws of consciousness, of which the articulated whole would constitute an essence. A law is a transcendent object of knowledge. There can be consciousness of a law, not a law of consciousness. This is why we can never prove a law-like construction, such as determinism, to actually operate upon human behaviour, upon human thought and action. Because ultimately, it is an expression of human thought and action, and everything that it investigates metaphysically is a construction of human thought and action. So as you can see, there can never be a law like generalization placed upon human thought and behavior. A point made beautifully by Alastair McIntyre, who shows that there are four modes of unpredictability that can never be overcome within human life. The first he talks of is one created by Karl Popper, and it's one which relies upon radical conceptualization. He takes radical conceptualization to be the creation of a new concept, something that is entirely brand new, something that has not been formed from putting two concepts together, but is actually something brand new, has never been thought of, a new idea. And what he says is that this can never be predicted. And the example he gives is this. Imagine that we are in the Stone Age. One of us predicts that in the next 10 years, there will be the creation of a wheel. The companion with us says, well, wait a minute, what is a wheel? And so one of us turns around and says, a wheel is, and with great detail explains what a wheel is, the way it functions, the way it looks, everything about it. And so we stand aghast because we have just invented the wheel. And so this could never be predicted because the prediction itself would include the prediction of the concept. It would not be the case that the wheel would be invented in 10 years, because at the moment of prediction, it would have been invented. The second point of unpredictability for McIntyre is our inability to predict our future thoughts and behaviours. We can never know what we will think next, because if we did know what we were thinking next, then we would have thought it now. What we think next is temporally absent within our mind. I cannot know what I will think next, because if I did know what I would think next, then I would not think that, I would think something else. I can never know what is going to occur next in my own mind. And this leads on to the next point, which is how this impacts game theory. Game theory is essentially the prediction of your opponent's behaviour predicting your behaviour. The unpredictability of game theory is based upon the fact that I do not know how I will respond to your future response. So even if I am able to predict your response, I have to be able to predict my response to your response to my response, which means that there is an inherent unpredictability presented by my response and your response ad infinitum. And the unpredictability of this scenario grows and grows, which is why it's so significant that the Grandmaster is eight steps ahead, because that level of prediction is impressive. The way I like to think of this is with body language. Body language is supposed to be a symbolic representation of an individual's internal state. Through analysing someone's body language, I'm supposed to be able to gain information about them and their psychological state. So if someone has crossed arms, I know that they are defensive and perhaps a little unconfident. If someone has open arms, I know that they are open and confident, apparently. But since I know that everybody knows about body language, I know that an individual can fake their body language. Take, for example, if I'm an interviewer and I'm interviewing someone. Someone does not want to be perceived as nervous because they think that would jeopardise their position within the company or their ability to obtain a position within the company. And so they sit with their arms open and they pretend to be confident. That does not necessarily make them confident. It makes them portraying confidence. And so there's a game going on. There's a game going on in every aspect of our lives in relation to body language and how we are appearing to the other. The last point of unpredictability for McIntyre is what's called contingency, in which we just do not know how an individual 
will react to certain unforeseen or unforeseeable events. So if there's something which happens to an individual that could not have been predicted, the theory of prediction could not have included this. Take Paris meeting Helen of Sparta. Helen of Sparta looking the way she did was unpredictable to Paris. Could not have predicted that Paris would have had the reaction he did to Helen's face. In fact, Helen's face, the face that launched a thousand ships, would then result in a myriad of future events. The Trojan Wars and the fall of Troy inspired Homer to write the Odyssey. The Odyssey going on to inspire many Greek philosophers such as Plato to be the bedrock of Western civilization and philosophical thought, which has been incredibly influential on philosophical and literary endeavors. No one could have predicted that Lord of the Rings would have been produced by the birth of a Spartan woman. In this way, the smallest trivialities can have an immense importance within our life. But if a theory cannot predict human action, how can determinism be true? Determinism, as Alex said, is a positive claim. Now, this doesn't absolve me of any burden of proof. Unlike my passive atheism, I make the active claim that I think free will does not exist. In which it argues that human action is predictable, can be understood, and is epistemologically possible to be predicted. But what these unpredictabilities have shown is that these are logically impossible to be predicted, that these can never be predicted. Alastair McIntyre says, we have then four independent but often related sources of systemic unpredictability in human life. It is important to emphasize that not only does unpredictability not entail inexplicability, but that its presence is incompatible with the truth of determinism in a strong version. If that is the case, determinism cannot be true because no law-like generalization could ever develop to predict human behavior. Psychology and sociologists as they try will never be able to predict human behavior. Economists will never be able to predict the next recession with accuracy that is 100%. There will never be a theory of human behavior in action. In which case, it can never be true. It can never be shown to be true. There we have it. Determinism is a theory which relies upon a contradiction. A contradiction in which supposes that a mind could construct an object which could come before it. So, determinism is debunked. And so, we now have what is known as the problem of indeterminism. So what we've learned here is that nothing can cause mind, nothing can come prior to mind, that everything in which we think is a prior cause to mind is actually a construction of mind. Well, that's great. Determinism is untrue. We must have free will then. No. <laughs> so as Alex pointed out, that just because our minds haven't been determined doesn't make us free. So free will, according to this compatibilist, can be defined simply as the ability to do what you want to do. This seems plausible at first, right? If you can do whatever you want, you're a free being. But there's a problem with this. And the problem I'm thinking of was highlighted well by the pessimist philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer, who pointed out that, yeah, sure, you can do whatever you will, but you can't will what you will, right? I mean, imagine that you wanted to save money, and so you put some funds into a bank account. According to Hobbes, so long as nothing external to you was compelling you or restricting you, you acted totally freely in depositing the money. But did you choose to want to save that money? Could you, if you so pleased, choose to want to waste the money instead? And that's not the same thing as simply choosing to waste it. Could you choose to want to waste it? I certainly can't choose to want to waste my own money. And even if you could choose to want it, crucially, in order to do so, you would need to want to want to do it. And if you could control that want, you'd need to want to want to want it, and so on forever. Schopenhauer's point is that the ability to do whatever you want can hardly be called freedom if you can't freely choose what it is that you want. So Sartre actually saw this spontaneity to be human freedom, which is why he says that we are condemned to be free. We can never be anything but indeterminate and in trying to explain our actions and behaviours. All we are doing is positing causes that are untrue. We are putting essence prior to existence and we are committing an epistemic failure. But I cannot help but feel shame when I am seen for Sartre. I cannot help but feel that I am being seen 
by the other. That when I see you and you see me, I understand that you are another individual who is a freedom external to mine. That you are a mind spontaneously arising from the nether. And that you make your own judgments. And that in those judgments, I am an object for you just as much as you are an object for me. So I am defenseless against your judgment. I can never do anything to change it because it is always absent within my reality. Your judgment is your judgment. It exists in your mind, in your freedom. Just as my judgment is my judgment. And so we become entangled in this desire to be seen as what we want to be. We wish to appear in a certain way. I want to be presented as the thing from which will gain your approval, which will make me feel pride, or I want to be seen as that thing which you hate. Either way, I wish to be the author of my actions because I feel shame or pride. The issue is I can't. <laughs> and so uh, there is no resolution here for Sartre. All of our actions are sadomasochistic. I'm either trying to modify your perception of me or I'm trying to conform myself to your perception of me. So I pretty much am doomed to this inauthentic life. And the reason which we cannot free ourselves from this is because all concepts for Sartre have not been chosen. All of my judgments from which I judge reality and myself have not been freely chosen. They've been given to me through the conceptualization process which has led to language. I've been born into this language. To use a Heideggerian expression, I am thrown into this world, into this phenomenal experience from which I understand reality. There is an absence of me within the concepts I use. The only me that is truly free is in that unintelligible world. So I am either caused by the concepts I use in which I sacrifice myself to language and exist in a life of bad faith, or I am a spontaneous being who is unintelligible to others and to myself, acting as a beast within the world. And so Sartre seems to be agreeing with Alex here in saying that we are never free. In fact, he goes on many times and says that I am enslaved. And so Sartre says, I am not what I am. And I think that is what Alex is saying when he talks about desire. That we cannot want what we want. I cannot own my desires because my desires are what I am. And so to say that I desire something other than what I desire is impossible. I could not choose something else. I am whatever I desire. But Sartre is kind of cynical. Sartre doesn't think that there is any unification between individuals that could ever occur. He doesn't think that our judgments could ever enlighten, but they can, because we are rational agents, and we can come to the same rational conclusions. And so we move on to the next point. What is freedom? So what Alex has shown us in his video, and very nicely done by the way, it's not enough to simply be unrestricted to get whatever we want in this Hobbesian sense. Uh, just because we get what we want doesn't mean that we caused what we want. He's also shown that in an indeterminate sense, even if we weren't caused, if we are causeless, well then, how can we say that it's what we want? We didn't choose what we want, and so we are subject to what we want. I am a slave to whatever I am. I can't decide to change what I am. I just happen and spontaneously enact my desires upon the world as best as I can. This is where free will is said to be impossible because if we are indeterminate or determinate, either way, we are not the cause of ourselves and our actions and our behaviours and our thoughts. And so we are not free. So although the indeterminacy from which we arise may seem absolutely contradictory to freedom, it isn't and can be best understood as the precondition of choice necessary for freedom. Think of it like this. When you act within the world, that is the possibility, that is the scenario, that is the moment in which you get to choose between two options. You get to make the decision. Now, when you make that decision, if you have no structures of meaning, language, no ability to deduce what is right, then your choice is random. However, 
if you commit yourself to the rational life, to the life that respects reason in its true form, its ability to be deduced by any agent, it's unbiased and objective. In that sense, if we can support our actions and our behaviours with a series of reasons and we act in relation to those reasons, then we are free. This is a point made very well by Dr. David Edward Rose in Phil and Continental Philosophy. It's a very useful resource which will explain this view in detail and in a way that's concise and easy to understand. So the point that he makes is actually in reference to Hegel. Hegel understands freedom to be a rational process, the process in which we can choose what gives significance and meaning to a series of actions and makes significant our lives. So what's important to understand about Hegel is that Hegel does not see freedom and reason as being attributed to an individual but to a group. In other words, when we work together to try and work out a shared goal, a shared dilemma, then we are capable of actually helping each other obtain freedom. Freedom is often seen as a moment, the moment in which we choose to do something. But freedom is the reasons from which we choose to do it. It is the meaning behind our actions. It is the ability to qualify why I acted that way and to say how I will act in the future because of said reasons. It is the ability to differentiate between what is a good desire and a bad desire. In this way, when I choose radically my end goal and what structures of meaning to enter into, I set forward an agenda, I set forward a way of behaving, I set forward a future series of actions. But I can reinvent myself at any time. I can choose to reject a certain desire, to accept another one. I can choose to act in any way, shape or form within this conceptual schemata, which gives my life meaning. So in this way, an individual can be their own author. They can engage with other individuals to actually understand themselves and come to rational conclusions with other individuals within our communicative environment. In fact, the communication necessary for concepts to function is implicit within an ethical relationship between two individuals in which they um, approve or deny the usage of each other's conceptualization. And Wittgenstein rightly showed the language games in which we play. The problem is how much game is involved and what's the goal of the game? Is the goal mutual or is it individual? Because if it's individual then the propositions I reject or deny have nothing to do with truth. They have to do with my asserted truth, whatever I think or want to be the case. And so we can end up in Sartre's sadomasochistic relationship. And so for the last section of this discussion, we will be engaging with the problem of ideology. So what the previous sections have taught us is that determinism is untrue, that we are indeterminate, spontaneous eruptions of consciousness, engaged in a conceptual schema that can be authored by ourselves and by others. But ultimately, it needs to be co-authored to be free. If the narrative is anything other than co-authored, it will be mistaken, it will be false, it will be asserted. There will be no objective standards to hold our concepts to. We need to engage with universals rather than assert individualistic particulars to take their place. And so Hegel and McIntyre have shown that we can be at home within this narrative. But is this just a feeling? Do we just feel as if we are agreeing with the socio-political environment? That the conclusions that we reach are our own when they aren't ideologically embedded within us. Nietzsche brought to light how ideology affects our ethical judgments. He showed that in the genealogy of morality and in many of his other works that we can trace back an underlying power structure through all of our conclusions. Nietzsche saw truth as nothing more than a currency. He saw it as ideological power fluctuating but to and fro within agents, that they represent the desires and the wants of various agents engaged within this sadomasochistic relationship. And so for Nietzsche, we are all players in a game, and the goal of the game is to triumph over one another, to have the will to power to triumph over any and all opposition.
But then what is truth? It doesn't exist. In fact, all of the arguments in which Nietzsche gives are dependent upon truth to exist. He is reliant upon a normativity which is ungrounded, which exists in between agents in a form of conceptual uncertainty. It only appears to be the case. It isn't the case. And so there is no reason to believe Nietzsche over anybody else. He is just one out of many aesthetic ideals, which I don't think you'd have a problem with. But as McIntyre points out in his rejection of Sartre, this is itself a normative claim. There's no reason to believe that we cannot have truth and normativity if we are relying upon normativity to conclude that. So ultimately, we are committed to normativity. There is no escape. There needn't be an absolute rejection of this normativity. This normativity can obtain truth, but it could be ideologically constrained. That means that there may be fragments of truth in it, aspects of truth, but these are tainted through power structures. And this is the point of Karl Marx. In Marx's critique of Hegel, he shows that Hegel is right in one respect. People do produce ideas. We do produce our institutions. But he shows something else to be the case. Just as much as people produce ideas, ideas produce people. And so what we have throughout all of the institutions of our lives is an underlying power structure. And as he points out in our current society, capitalism permeates everything. It is involved in all of our institutions, involved in our ways of thinking and our ways of being and our ways of living. Fundamentally, we are capitalists. We are socio-historically embedded. Not something that Hegel would disagree with, in fact. Hegel would absolutely agree. The primary difference between Hegel and Marx is his belief that the institutions which we now occupy are incapable of obtaining truth in any meaningful sense. They have aspects of truth within them, but they are blinding us ideologically from the truth. And so what we need to do is remove those power structures. We need to remove that ideology to gain any notion of freedom. The problem of ideology is, is that I cannot understand anything beyond it. Ideology is my way of thinking. It is this way of being. It is the judgments we make. And so the conclusions I reach may very well have been placed there through an ideological format. We are all living in an environment which is hierarchical, which produces norms and conventions which allow, which allow us to understand ourselves and behave within the world. And so when I associate my identity with a given structure of meaning, I am then trapped in that structure. To be understood is to conform to the normative environment, and to conform to the normative environment is to conform to the power structure that produced it. So the question is, how do we free ourselves? Do we revolt? Well, no, because if we revolt, that's just the Sartrean rejection. We reject the structures of meaning and we are indeterminate. Do we accept this ideology? Well, no, if we accept this ideology, then we are being caused by something other than ourselves and we are not free. Can we get out of this ideological prison? The solution to ideology comes to us in the form of hermeneutics in which we analyse the concepts we have and rationally engage with them and one another to see whether they actually obtain truth value or whether we are being manipulated by the power structure. However, when we use this hermeneutic analysis from universal to individual to universal again, there can be blind spots in ideology. We cannot conceptualise certain aspects of our ideology which are constraining us. We may be unaware of them because we are being manipulated to, to the nth degree. And this is where the philosophy of Slavoj Žižek and many other continental philosophers comes into play. Žižek understands that there is aspects of reality in terms of ideology which go beyond our immediate perception. That when we look at reality, what we are seeing is a spectacle. We are seeing a upside down inverted image of reality and not reality itself. And 
this isn't necessarily something that we can just snap out of. It's also not necessarily something that we can just analyze our way out of either, because we need a form of analysis, which is, although rational and histor and historically progressing, it must also have a goal and an understanding of how to identify certain ideological features of our reality. It's not enough that it is able to self-correct. There must be a self-correcting methodology, which is ultimately allowing us to progress towards freedom. Zizek talks about what are called the sublime objects of ideology. This is a combination of a few philosophical points. Sublime being transcendent of our reality. It's something that we do not reach uh, and cannot know in itself. Object is obviously to be an object, to be something which is actually to be understood. And ideology is, as it sounds to be, the structure of ideas and concepts which confine our thinking, the limitation to our possibilities. In such, he identifies that there are sublime objects of ideology. For example, he sees the Communist Party in the USSR as being a sublime object of ideology, something which dictates and outlines the ideology for everyone else, and is such the spontaneous eruption of ideology within the universal mind that is this shared ideological consciousness. It is the locus point. It is the point in which allows us to understand everything, okay? And so to see it is to basically look at oneself. You'd have to be able to, there are certain points that we miss when we look through our eyes, for example. When I look through my eyes, I cannot see my eye. I cannot see what I'm looking through, but what I'm looking through determines what I see. And so do these sublime objects of ideology. They determine what we see, but we cannot see them. But this for Zizek allows us to create a methodology based upon Laconian psychoanalysis, which allows us to understand these objects and overcome them. Lacan was a French psychoanalyst who wanted to bring back the work of Freud. And he also married a lot of what Freud did with continental philosophy and other pursuits that he actually engaged within. And so he believed Freud was right and created his own Freudian theory. And he relied upon what were called three registries to understand the human psyche. These registries were the imaginary, the symbolic and the real. They pretty much can be taken at face value here. So the imaginary is your imagination, your ability to have radical conceptualization and thought processes. The symbolic is language. When we apply a concept to the world, when we communicate with one another, when we symbolize an object. The real is the object. The real is reality in its unsymbolized state. It is that which is ultimately resistant to our symbolization and therefore kind of unknowable. But it's also kind of knowable, which is very much Hegelian. And why I'm in love. We live in, for Lacan, a symbolic world. In fact, our very unconscious is structured like a language. And so when an individual has a psychological problem, the problem can be analysed through analysing the words that they use. There is a separation between the words that I speak and my meaning, and that separation can be identified, but I cannot identify it. I need another individual who can show me the pattern, who can show me through analysis what I truly mean, the meaning hidden within my enunciation. It is in Lacan that we recognise that the real, that represents the unsymbolized, unknown agent, can be known in the absence of the symbol. And so the paradoxical nature of individuals and society are very similar. It is in difference itself that we can gain information. Hegel shows that being and nothingness are one and the same thing in terms of our ability to understand them. In and of themselves, they are infinites. And being such, they are unknowable. He gives an analogy in the phenomenology. When you walk into a room that is bright white and blinding, or you walk into a room that is pitch black, is there a difference? In both cases, you are blinded. There is no information you can gain because they are infinitely unknowable. There is too much data. There is no ability to differentiate 
But what you can do is differentiate a bright white room and a pitch black room. And because of those differentiations, when there is an absence of light, you gain information that is non-infinite and knowable. And that's why it is in becoming that we understand reality, within the destruction of the immediate experience and the movement towards the absence of the immediate experience, the movement between being and nothingness, that we actually understand determinate objects for Hegel. It is not, we do not understand the thing in itself, we understand parts of the thing moving us towards understanding more and more of reality to a greater degree as we synthesize to a greater degree the determinant aspects. We get little parts, we we'll put them together and we put together a big unified whole. We just don't, we don't look at the universe and know, know it for what it is. We instead look at little parts of the universe, little parts of our perception, break it down, put them together and expand our worldviews. But the important thing to take away from this is this point of difference being fundamentally the way in which we acquire knowledge. And this is the same for Zizek and Lacan. Lacan says there is no meta language. And what Zizek points out is that's because he takes it literally. Unlike the post structuralists who understand there to be no meta narrative which governs our way of thinking and understanding reality, he instead says there is no meta language because there's no need for one. All language is object language. When I talk about language itself, I am analysing language as an object of my conversation. And this is because laws, no matter what they are, are objects. They are held by individuals and are available to consciousness. The very limits of language seem to elude us. But it is in these limits that we gain what language is. We can understand the limits of language in what we cannot speak about. And this is what Zizek is pointing out with ideology. Points in which we cannot gain knowledge and talk about our ideologies are the points in which we understand the sublimity of our ideologies, the points which exceed onwards. We start to grasp the real in the sense that it is resisting symbolization. But in its resistance, we are given the moment, the opportunity, to construct and create a new symbol, a way to understand and reflect upon this resistance, upon this relationship between the symbolic and the real. And that gives us the point of analysis. This is the point in which the psychoanalyst is engaged in understanding the individual, and this is the point in which the political critic should be engaged within ideology. And so this gives us the opportunity to engage and take responsibility for our identities. When I say what I am, I mean what I am. But I am also aware that I am not what you take me to be. And so in that absence, in that difference, I can understand that there are aspects of myself are aspects of reality, aspects of our institutions, which are not aligned with the expression of subjectivity. That the objective and subjective freedom is not in line, and I can see the paradoxical contradiction that exists between my trying to express freedom and my subjectivity being hindered by that expression. And so I seek to modify and change the ideological structure that is around us. But I cannot simply reject it because then I am left in this meaningless mildew of infinite reality, and instead I have to work within it to construct new symbolic references, to create arguments and structures of meaning which allow us to create a greater and greater understanding of ourselves and our institutional environment. And as I do such, I can understand the corruption of power structures and the influence of ideology. I can understand that which is preventing me from undergoing this process. And so this is why for Hegel, we can understand that being a slave is actually a choice. It's not that Hegel believes that the slave put chains on his wrists and submitted himself to the master. It is the fact that a slave is only a slave when they accept the identity of being a slave. But in the moment that they accept this identity, they have the option to reject it. The slave has the option to become the freedom fighter. Yo. 
One week's pay. It's the best I could do. Wait! Hey! You better find yourself someplace to hide and keep praying nobody ever finds you. Try these on. Look, you crazy mother. And this is why freedom for Dr. Rose, for Hegel, for Zizek and myself would be a process. It's a rational endeavour in which we engage with concepts to try and create as much as possible a free environment. There are points in which we are unfree, in which we are caused, and there are points in which we are free and are actually engaged within self-understanding and rational discourse to a way that actually reflects who we are and what we wish to achieve. So I hope this video has explained why I would argue for freedom. And so for a quick summary, here were the arguments. The first argument was that determinism is untrue. Determinism relies upon a structure of normativity which itself rejects. It tries to place an object of mind as prior to mind, denying the metaphysical relations between mind and reality and rejecting the phenomena which is impossible, and therefore determinism is untrue. The second point was on indeterminism. To be causeless is not freedom, but instead we must also have a content to our desires. These desires must be given their content willfully by the agent, otherwise the individual cannot be said to be free. We have to want what we want. The third point was to show how we can want what we want. That there are structures of meaning which we can align ourselves with, and that these structures of meaning can give reasons and justifications for our desires and actions. These reasons and justifications can themselves be corrupted by ideology and that our process of trying to gain freedom can be our enslavement. It can be a reflection from ideological baggage produced by power structures. And finally, this is to conclude that this ideological structure can be itself analysed in the hermeneutic relationship between the individual and their language, the individual and their institutions. And that when we analyse our institutions and we analyse our concepts, we can come to rational conclusions about whether they are actually allowing us to express our identity to the greatest degree. Alex, if you think I have made a mistake at any point in this video and you would like to point out that determinism is in fact true and I am sorely mistaken, please go ahead and respond. I would love to hear back from you and have some feedback. Thank you all for watching and as always, try to gain some perspective.